I apologize in advance for the mic or the raw sound of the audio. I'm using this opportunity of June 20th, 2022, or Juneteenth, the most recent federal holiday, to start a conversation with listeners live on stream. You can join this conversation as I so often invite listeners to do. And in the past, when I say join, it's usually by way of going to Apple Podcasts, leaving a comment, or going on Facebook. This, however, is my first live show where a listener can join, call in, and have a real on-air discussion. Today, the discussion will focus on exploring the purpose of this newest federal holiday, Juneteenth. Yesterday was June 19th, 2022, and I took the opportunity to ask some probing questions of myself and my family, my two sons, about what this holiday meant, why it was there. I was conflicted and have been conflicted recently as I learned more about Juneteenth. I have to say, growing up, it was not something that was celebrated, although my family has a history. My father was an educator. He was actually an an educator of African-American history and also taught a very popular class at the time entitled Negro in America and has explored extensively, has had written extensively about the experience of the African diaspora in American and in the Caribbean, which is directly where my family comes from. But it wasn't a time that was celebrated. It came to a head and I became more aware of the history and the background of Juneteenth with the most recent awakening of white America as to the country's um, most corrupt institution. Institutions are what we explore on this program, Legally Brief, be it an educational institution, be it religious or legal, we explore institutions and the impact that they have on our culture and us as individuals, both personally and professionally. So what is, I think it's appropriate to kind of start about what is Juneteenth, just so we all understand what we're speaking about. Juneteenth was a time, and I guess that the most easiest way that it's thought of is it was an it's an observation of events that took place in Galveston, Texas, in the in 1865. In particular, as the story goes, as a historical story goes, soon after uh, President Lincoln. And I shouldn't say soon after, it was some 24 to two years later is what we estimate. President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. And sometime later, two and a half, two years later, enslaved Africans and African-Americans were told that this proclamation had been issued and that they as enslaved persons were now free. There can be a whole nother discussion and episode about what that actually meant and the reason for the Emancipation Proclamation. We know that the sanitized version of history is that this was a bold and a brave move by the president at the time. There, I think that that is being debunked and it's really grounded in it was a strategic wartime discussion that or decision that was made that would weaken forces, the Confederate forces in the South and allow for the enlistment of African and African-American individuals to fight for union forces in the North. One of the myths, and it was very interesting, National Public Radio created a very informative article on yesterday, dated yesterday, it was written by John Burnett, and I found it to be really interesting. It laid out some of the myths and facts around Juneteenth. 
one of the interesting myths that is promoted along with this new federal holiday is that individuals, Africans and African-Americans in Galveston, Texas, that it was through this um, information that there was a general that arrived in Galveston, Texas, General Gordon Granger arrived there with an order and proclaimed again to you know, enslaved individuals, hey, did you know you're finally free? So that's a myth. And factually, we there is historical evidence, reasonable, practical, statistical, anecdotal evidence that shows that many enslaved individuals knew about the original emancipation order issued by President Lincoln in 1865 based on the very sophisticated um, information system that Black Americans had set up in that time, and that they also would have overheard white slave owners talking about Lincoln's proclamation being issued. This was something that was talked about and discussed privately among plantation owners. It was going to directly affect them. So African Americans would have heard about this. And according to Civil War historian Edward Cotham, who is the author of Juneteenth, the story behind the celebration, that news of Lincoln's proclamation, it would have spread like, and I quote, wildfire. Many slaves would have known about it even before their slave owners. But here is the problem. And we see this so many times. There was no one to enforce Lincoln's 1963 proclamation. Quite to the contrary, you we had individuals who were kept in a state of extreme unimaginable deprivation, zero resources, zero ability to establish themselves. So what were they to do with this proclamation? No one to, again, no one to enforce it, no one to help them move. You had to think about the practical things. You have to eat, feed a family, keep yourself warm, keep yourself safe. What were you going to do? Pack up your zero belongings, because remember, you would have had a slave owner or a plantation over tell you none of this belongs to you. So were you then to set out and go where? To a hostile environment within the within Texas and start to walk? It's not as if you could have called an Uber or jumped on the Amtrak and headed to relatives in, you know, in the north or in other parts of the state. Remember, slavery was a very intricate network of destabilizing and lay, layering on the dis, destabilizing value of trauma on top of each other. So from the moment you had been stolen or taken from the continent of Africa, taken from your home, you were constantly, daily, by every moment, destabilized so that your mind, your body, and your nervous system was in a constant survival, flight, or fright, or most likely and most prominently freeze mode. We know so much more in the general population about the nervous system and how it responds to trauma and stress. And you are, as an African or African-American, being held against your will in, slave, in this institution of slavery, you are every moment, every morning, every day faced with trauma, not knowing you have no control, no agency over your mind, over your body. And that constant shifting ground or shifting sand under you has you in such a way that a proclamation would have meant nothing without a network of support coming from family, coming from community, coming from 
state, federal government, that's what would be, have been needed to rebuild. Just think now when an individual suffers a loss or some type of trauma, maybe even a death in their family, you have an immediate, let's, let's talk about it in, in a granular sense. Say, uh, I'm thinking now of a friend who's um, had a death in the family. There was immediately a text that went around among the other parents, the other moms, to set up a network of meal delivery. Uh, there was emails that went around of who would be picking up all of picking up the other kids from school. There was a constant visual. And I know that two, three months and even beyond after that individual suffered a loss, we were still had a schedule of check-ins to determine how we can help, how we can support, how we can stabilize and put the ground back under that family. Likewise, there were safety nets. I've had clients where um, I've represented indigent individuals and they have suffered loss or death in their family. And I knew how to pull on resources in the community to get them free therapy, to even uh, cost or free burial of their, of their dead. I knew how to pull their resources together to get them food, to get them whatever they needed. There was no such system. So you had individuals who were not only, who were not only still grieving, losing their connection to their country, to their home, to their language. They could have been sold over and over again and not even know where their immediate new family members were in this country within Texas. So the Emancipation Proclamation, even though this was a grand gesture, some would say, some would argue it was not, it was a strategic war gesture by Lincoln, there was no um, army to enforce it, and there was no social at any level to support individuals now, quote unquote, being free. What also, where again, what is, um, what is Juneteenth? It's a time that some would say to celebrate. It's a time to remember it's a time to grieve and to mourn. I have decided yesterday when I, again, I've been asking myself, what is this? What is this holiday? Some offices are closed. I had a conversation with a colleague whose office did not close, who the attorneys are required to work. So some people are just ignoring it. Some, uh, you can imagine some may be, there may be eye rolls about it. This has no bearing on me, no significant. I invite listeners, I invite individuals who are conflicted about what the meaning of this, to let it be a day of education. And by education, I mean tangible education and action. Today, my children who go to school in Matasquan, New Jersey, a rather affluent town in New Jersey, they are in school. So there's no commemorating, there's no opportunity taken, they're taking final exams, to let one of the established institutions, academic, school, education, they did not use this opportunity to bring in a new generation and speak to them through an assembly, speak to them maybe even through casual discussions to talk about not for two seconds in their history books, there were slaves here, they were freed by the emancipation, okay, next, go on to the next subject. But instead, this opportunity within the educational institutions, at least where I am in New Jersey, it was missed. This could have been a chance to talk about myths, talk about the impact of uh, remembering things like George Floyd, talk about the impact of how you can be an anti-racist, talk about 
ways that you can look at no one is better than the other. Talk about even what I know to be some fears among my friends and colleagues in the white community about not making this a discussion about white guilt, but making it a discussion about how we are truly not better or not worse because of our skin color and how privilege can be used by used to advance and to equalize and to correct institutions that have been set up to hurt and harm. So this opportunity has been missed. And that's what Juneteenth at this point is being cultivated in my home and by me as a chance to educate and as a chance to mourn and correct, mourn what's been done in the past and also an opportunity to correct this institution. Our country has been set up, has been created around a corrupt institution, and it's filtered into every aspect of our life. I'd like to think that if you were born in America, you drink it. It's in the water. All of us, we've been impacted by this. And this Juneteenth is an opportunity to pull back and to sit down and to slow down holidays. That means that the courts are closed, the federal offices are closed. But if you take five or 10 minutes, expand your understanding, expand your knowledge of areas that you don't normally do. Have conversations if you're in a white home. Have conversations about, well, what, what, it, what does it mean to have white skin? What does it mean to have a environment where the pictures, where the movies, where the novels are all centered around white culture. Is that right? Is it wrong? What are we missing? Are my kids, and if you are, I mean, I'm speaking, if my kids, if you're a white American, are my kids missing out on something? Are they missing out on being curious? Curiosity drives and it creates so much. So by asking those questions, it would be akin to the conversation that you've heard that every Black parent has, that conversation of the conversation. And what that means is that we as African-American parents have this burden and this duty to tell our kids that preventively we don't want to have the conversation. We don't want to interrupt their childhood innocence with, hey, you are put in this wonderful skin, but this wonderful skin will be used as a weapon by others. So you have to be extra careful when you interact with individuals of authority. You have to be extra careful because people will make assumptions about you. That's the conversation that you have because we want to keep our kids safe. I invite individuals who are not living and do not have a history of being in this skin, in a brown or black skin, to have a similar conversation. Use Juneteenth to have a similar conversation, to talk about what it is to be totally flushed every day with white culture and what can be absent from that and what it means and how we can invite curiosity into that home and into that life. There is um, another part and another reason that I want to discuss about Juneteenth and then we'll wrap up. It was an article that was showcased on LinkedIn today and it had to do with the founder. They called her the, uh, I think the grandmother of Juneteenth. And she is now being nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. And um, I'm looking right now for her name. It just, it just escaped me, but and I know that the first name is Opal. Her first name is Opal. And 
as I'm doing this live. So I'm not putting, you know, I don't have it all written out. But there is one thing that's interesting about that, that this fight to have the federal holiday recognized has been going on for several for several decades. So it's not something that just came out of the blue. And there are individuals all over, Black activists all over this world and all over this country who have been working for this. So I do honor this. And by saying that maybe I personally don't see this as a celebration and I'm looking at it through the lens of <laughs> I'm always feeling as if the failure of institutions to act on the obvious is a source of frustration of me with me and I feel that Juneteenth is a reminder that here you had two and a half two years prior to an order being issued by the president of the United States at that time, President Lincoln, that it took not, it's not only two years, but it's still going on, that the full recognition, the full acceptance of individuals that live in black and brown bodies as equal in this country, equal in our institutions, be they corporate, educational, or judicial, has not been realized. That for me is a source of frustration. It's a force, source of anguish. But I will, although I don't feel celebratory, I am forever indebted for those individuals who worked for this holiday and had enough foresight to push for it for years in Galveston Island, Texas, all around the country. And to get this passed, to get it done, I remember also, I'm using today also as a time to remember George Ford, Breonna Taylor, Sandra Bland, and all the other lives that were lost recently that gave rise to the 2020 civil uprising and the um, Black Lives Matter movement. I celebrate them also. I celebrate them on this day. And going back further, as proof and evidence that while not fast enough, change is coming and change is happening within this institution. That is what I wanted to share on this first live stream. And again, this is my first time doing it. I hope that the audio is not too raw in your ears. I'm gonna publish this. I'm, I'm not editing it, I'm sharing my thoughts and this was fun and I hope to do this again on another topic. Again, I wish you the best on this holiday and I hope both in your home and in your office that you use this as a time for discussion to remember if you're celebrating to celebrate and also as a time to educate yourself as to this institution and ways to reform it. Until next time, be well and take care.